Hello, everyone. What a great sight to see this group here in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Rush Celebration Day. My name is Greg Harris, and I'm privileged to be the president and CEO of this great museum. And on behalf of all of our staff, on behalf of everybody here in Northeast Ohio, we're thrilled that so many people came here to help us celebrate these Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees, Rush. The museum has now been open 24 years. 12 million people have come here. They've experienced our mission to engage, teach, and inspire through the power of rock and roll. And there's no better way to do that than to hear the stories from the actual people that made the music that meant so much to all of us, right? Every day is special here, but when we have Hall of Fame inductees, it's at a whole nother level. And today is a special day. Let me introduce Dr. Jason Hanley, who runs programming and visitor engagement here at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He's our vice president. He's going to introduce the guys and bring them on stage for you, okay? Jason Hanley. Very well done. Thank you, Greg. All right. Wow. Look at this crowd. You guys look awesome out here today. Welcome to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It's so exciting to have you all here. Thank you for braving the possible storm. It's starting to snow, but we're going to be fine, right? Woo! All right, um, just to give you a little bit of an idea of what we're doing here uh, this afternoon, we'll have about a 40-minute uh, you know, or so interview up here on stage, and then uh, part of that will include a Q&A. Thank you to all of you who submitted questions online beforehand. So if you're a lucky one, I'm going to get to pick one of those, and we'll get to ask uh, Alex and Getty one of those questions a little bit later. I should also say hello to everyone out there watching on the stream. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, enjoy it. People around the world are watching today. Um, I also want to thank our partner Sirius XM. Uh, we're recording this for Sirius XM and it, the Rush Fan Day special will actually be airing on multiple channels throughout the next week on Sirius XM. So thank you so much to our partners there. Um, Afterwards, I'll walk through some of the uh, specifics for all of you for going downstairs and getting your book signed. Just remember, there's a lot of you and we're all in this together. Just keep that in mind all day, all right? So, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees, Alex Lifeson and Getty Lee. Is this mic on? Hi, everyone. You're a beautiful sight out there. Thank you for coming down today. I brought my BFF from Toronto with me. I don't know if How you know you this guy. Oh, look, what a nice crowd. We haven't seen one of these in a while. <laughs> I see some familiar faces. Yeah, but still familiar faces for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, so why are we here again? Well, we're going to talk about your book for starters, I think. <laughs> oh, right, right, right. I'm shamelessly promoting a book. Yeah, and then we're going to dance a little bit. And you're shamelessly promoting. <laughs> you know, I got the book um, a couple weeks ago, I think, I, I got a copy from you. And I got to say, I don't know if, you've, if any of you have the book yet. Isn't it awesome? Uh, honest to God, I... I love it. I think it is so good. It's so interesting, fascinating information, but in such a <laughs> complimentary. Uh, it's the first installment. <laughs> but it's just a real pleasure to go through that book and read all the interesting stuff, but it's done in such a conversational way. It's really, you know, it's not too much geeky muso kind of stuff and the photographs are beautiful and uh and it's also a great weight uh, you know you can keep stuff down you can exercise with it yeah you, yeah. Can, you can throw it at people and <laughs> yeah. when you're so. just don't drop it on your foot exactly so 
Well, thank you. Well, I appreciate you saying that. I, I, I mean it sincerely. When, when you started, I mean, it's been a couple of years that you've worked on the book. Yeah. Um, how did you lead up to that? Like, what inspired you to, to do it? It was a lot of work. Yeah, I didn't realize it was going to be so much work, of course. Uh, maybe I would have had second thoughts about it. But uh, it all started like this. So um, I, I talk about this in the book, of course, but uh, just to do a little bite-sized capsule of it. You know, back when we were rehearsing, uh, I think it was for the Clockwork Angels tour, somebody approached me and wanted uh, to trade one of my backup instruments, uh, not, not a main instrument, but you know, just one of my instruments for a vintage bass. And I had never collected any vintage basses because the only basses I used in my career were really basses that would fit into the kind of identity and soundscape that I was trying to develop for myself. So, and that's a story with most musicians, right? I mean, like, you use the instruments as tools to give you the tone you want to express yourself the way you need to. So I never looked at my own instrument as collectibles, uh, just as my tools, just as, as you do. Uh, so um, I said, okay, I was kind of curious because one of the bases was a 1953 Fender uh, Precision Bass, and that's the year of my birth. Uh, now you know how ancient I am. Uh, I'm still younger. <laughs> you are younger. Um, anyway, so it sparked a curiosity. And uh, curiosity is dangerous for me because I'm a kind of obsessive personality. When I was a kid, I collected stamps obsessively. Uh, when I started getting into music, I collected records. I still have all my vinyl squirreled away somewhere. Uh, wrapped up in plastic uh, and you know later in life I became uh, a baseball nut as most of you know uh, and then I started wanting to learn about the history of the game why because of that word curiosity I was curious as to the history of the great game the national pastime and that introduced me to the history of America over the 150 years or so of baseball's existence. So these things became, uh, these obsessions became windows into the past, windows into time. And when I got that 53 uh, Fender bass, the same kind of curiosity was sparked in me. And I realized I had held this instrument in my hands for over 42 years, and I knew very little about how it came to exist. You know, I knew very little about all the stories and all the people that went into developing these instruments in the middle of the century. So uh, that I said to my, I said to Scully, I said, hey, maybe we should uh, just get a modest collection of maybe 12 iconic bases from the guys that I love, like Jack Bruce's EB3 and, you know, Antwistle's Thunderbird, et cetera, et cetera, McCartney's, uh, 501 violin bass and that's that was my modest uh, goal back then and about 280 bases later here I am <laughs> so anyway to directly relate to your question uh, during the collecting of bases like any other obsession you uh, you learn stories you learn stories some of these bases arrive with stories, you know, owned by one guy, for example, is one of my bases that I got from, uh, it's a 1964 Dakota Red Jazz bass, and I found it in Dublin. And it belonged to one gentleman who played an Irish show band, and uh, he played that bass his whole life, and when I opened the case, you could smell the beer and the cigarettes <laughs> wafting out, uh, and it looked like it had lived a life. And so those kind of instruments speak to me. And, and I started thinking about how people spend their time. OK, so this was a guy who didn't get to play big arenas like we do. But what did he do? Whenever he could, he got a gig. And he played with that bass. And that was everything to him. It was, for a time, probably a way of him making a living. For a time, it was how he got his jollies on the weekend. So I have great respect for those things. So as I started collecting more bases, more of these stories started tumbling out. And sometimes the stories were 
uh, stories in acquiring the thing. Sometimes they were the instruments themselves, and sometimes they were just nerdy sort of pursuits of why is this bass different in 1967 than it was in 1960. So all those things said to me, uh, I said to myself, you know what, there really isn't a book out there that does my instrument justice. Uh, and aside from the fact that aesthetically there are beautiful examples of mid-century art and, and people admire mid-century furniture, mid-century painting, but I felt like my bass, my instrument, was getting the short shrift. So uh, that's why I did the book. And I had no idea it would be such a monumental pursuit. You know, we've... Did I put you to sleep? No, <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> um, you know, we've worked together for, what? Six or seven 50 years now. We've, <laughs> we've been writing music together, and I've always... And hopefully it won't stop. But... Um, <laughs> I've always thought one of, one of the great things about our relationship in a writing relationship is I tend to be kind of impulsive about the things that I do. It's the first few moments or the first few takes that are probably my stronger work. Whereas with you, you take your time, you filter everything, you look at all possible options and venues before you finally decide. So here you have a big collection of bass guitars, lots of photographs, structurally for the book. How did you approach it, knowing that this is kind of your MO, that you're yeah. gonna spend hours and hours and hours? Like, that must have been grueling for you, I, I would think. I think it was more grueling for the people I work with. <laughs> because, you know, as you know, uh, I'm pretty hard on recording engineers because I get really obsessive about details. And uh, I think when people signed up, like Richard uh, Sibold, who did the most incredible photography that you can see on the screens here. I mean, uh, he's really elevated the art form of, of photographing a guitar. And it, basically, he moved into my house, in, in a sense. My wife very kindly said, oh, if you need a place to shoot your instruments, why don't you take my art studio? Because she, she's a painter. And uh, she would hate me saying that out loud, by the way. Uh, and so we transformed her art studio into a, a severe photographic, uh, you know, sort of a heaven. We had different setups for different instruments because different instruments require different lighting to show off their beautiful, you know, contours. Um, and so he, what we thought would take a month or so was over a year of him up there and, uh, and a lot of back and forth and the long suffering Scully Macintosh, my, my main man was, you know, barking at him as he set up all these instruments and it was pretty funny in sight. And of course I engaged my friend Daniel Richler, who's a, a writer and a, and a, a sort of a, a pop culture expert to help me hammer out the words so I got them all in the right order. Uh, so uh, it was a lot of work. It was tough and it was, I, I kind of liken it to doing a documentary as opposed to writing a book because you sort of have a team of people that you have to sort of corral and make sure we have the work. The first version of the book, when I sent it to my editor, she said a couple of things about it. She said, uh, I that she'd never seen a, a book on this kind of uh, subject played out with such passion on the pages and with such humor, which I really appreciated. <laughs> but she also said, I've never received a manuscript that was 845 pages before. <laughs> so to speak to your point, uh, I got a bit carried away and it, it took quite a, a lot of learning on my side. For the, the good people at Harper Design basically taught me how to rearrange my book and we got it down to 408 pages so uh it's still nine pounds don't drop it <laughs> yeah that's really quite a task that it goes you were explaining when we were coming down here how you go through so many different levels of editing and a lot of people touch the book and they all have their own way of doing things and what they have in mind and quite often as we've experienced with record company people, for example, yeah. they don't really have a sense of what it means to you and, and how important those things are. So it's, 
that's got to be hard. Yeah, I was very lucky, though, because I had such a great team. Uh, the people at Harper's, they really understood uh, what I wanted to do. I, I didn't want this to be a typical guitar book that looked sort of like a pamphlet. I wanted it to be, I wanted to elevate the instrument to its rightful place, you know. Uh, I'm, I love the bass, man. <laughs> and, uh, and, they're, <laughs> and they're beautiful instruments. And when you hold them and you look at them in, in, in the light, that I, I have come to look at them. Um, I wanted that photo, the photography to reflect it. Yeah. And Richard really did nail that. And Daniel put up with my incessant, uh, you know, that comma's in the wrong place, and blah, blah, blah. And uh, he was, uh, the two of us were sitting there researching and researching for months. Uh, and it really turned into be quite a, a magnificent adventure and a journey for me, so. The photographs are stunning. Like Richard did an amazing job. Yeah, thank he you. You really did. He, he brought did. up so much character in the instruments, and and uh, you know, there's a really there's a real emotional response when you look at those those pictures, which leads me to the next question. Um, you you interviewed a lot of different people, a lot of different bass players and collectors, and uh, the one that 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 stands out for me is John Paul Jones. You know, we have such a history with Led Zeppelin right. and. And, uh, and he sounds like such a wonderful person. Yeah. But he, he says in, in, in that uh, interview that how he used to go to a little music shop in Soho and stare at, the, at this red Fiesta uh, position, I think it was, yeah. um, for five or 10 minutes, just staring at it. Yeah. And then he would go home and dream about it. Yeah. How, does that, how does that sense of passion and interest and and that uh, longing for something like that, uh, how do you respond to that kind of emotion? And how did you find uh, the commonality of all the people that you spoke to, where their beginnings were? Were they similar? Uh, very much so, and I think that was, my favorite part of the book really was talking to these chaps. And I, you know, I say in the book, I could have easily done a book of nothing but interviews with these cats, because they were so interesting and for the most part, so lovely. And it's a shared passion, you know, when, when John Paul Jones is talking about staring at that Fiesta Red Bass, I know that feeling. I remember going downtown Toronto and looking at the Rickenbackers hanging in, in Longham McQuaid in Toronto. I remember seeing Moss Wright guitars in this weird little shop downtown and I'm thinking, wow, what, what unusual shape that is. You know, they look like they landed from another planet to me. So, uh, but every one of those guys, and, and the guys that I decided in the end to interview were from a, a, a real variety, you know. I could have easily interviewed every great player, but the book really isn't about playing per se. It's about that period of time that these instruments were being made. It's about collecting and the mania for collecting, and it's about the atmosphere that surrounds the love of these instruments. And, each one of these guys shines a light on a different aspect that connect to the theme of that book and the period of time from 1950 to the mid, uh, mid 70s. Uh, so uh, it was just so fun and to be on the other side like you are with me today. You're interviewing me. Can you believe that? He's interviewing me. Uh, and I had to learn how to interview these guys. And the first interview I did was with Bill Wyman and that was at uh, a restaurant in Chelsea in the UK. And, uh, you know, I was a rookie at it. I was, I was a little nervous. And, uh, you know, Daniel was with me, and he had met him before. And, and, you know, he's a tough cat to interview from two perspectives, because number one, he's so interesting, and he has so many interests. He's an amateur archaeologist. He's a photographer. He's written, like, eight, nine books. Uh, he's even written a, a, a mystery novel. So he wants to talk to you about everything but basses. And I'm like, but, but, but I'm here to talk about bass. I had to keep you know, corralling him back to the subject. And I thought, well, is that what it's like interviewing me? I, I don't know. But uh, you know, it turned out to be a fantastic afternoon. And we got, of course, what we needed to. But it was a, a real edifying experience to meet some of uh, my fellow bass folk, as I like to refer to them. As the co collection grew, um, what sort of shape were the, were the guitars in? Did they require a lot of work to get them playable? Uh, I'm guessing that they were all pretty 
pretty decent, in, in, even though they have, uh, you know, years on them. But generally, w w was there a lot of work involved in getting that, them? That, that's a great question. Um, there's two types of collecting, and anyone that's here that collects anything will know this. Most collectors want that, uh, what we call a closet queen, right? Uh, that's uh, that's a, an instrument that looks like it's been in a time capsule for 60 years. You know, that's what most collectors want, no matter what it is, whether it's a bass or whether it's stamps Cars. or, you know, uh, whatever. They want that untouched piece of time, like it's been locked away. Uh, and I collect those, and there's a number of them in the book, but I also like the ones that when you look at them, you go, oh my God, if this thing could talk, the stories it would tell you, you know? And as I alluded to earlier, they represent a lot to the person that owned them. So sometimes they arrive, and usually the ones that have been under a bed for, you know, 60 years are a little stiff. They're not natural, you know, playing instruments because no one's played them. You know, my friend Colin likes to say, when he describes these instruments, he said, well, Johnny wanted drums for Christmas, but he got a bass guitar. So it ended up under his bed for 60 years. Uh, but the ones that are beat up and have really lived a life generally feel great when they arrive, and, and they're the real players. Did you play all of them? When yeah, you got every them? single one. Yeah. Ah, that's cool. Uh, it's like Christmas when everyone arrives. You know, you open it and you have to plug it in. And, and Daniel was really good at saying, well, you know, record your, your thoughts at how you feel playing them because that's another insight into the instrument. And I really wanted the book to be conversational, sort of like us now, just sort of, although this is a one-way conversation, but, uh, you know, just I want people to understand the experience of making the thing, who made it, where did it come from, why does it exist, and what does it sound like? you know, in the hands of, of a player. What, what did it mean to that person? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really comes across that way. Very, very casual and inclusive, you know? Oh, good. So, where do you go from here? I, I know you have a couple of other things like this planned, but uh, longer term, what, what, do you, what, what do you plan for the collection? Um, well, I've got a couple of longer exhibits planned in various parts of, the, of uh, North America, and I, I really like that idea. Like, we have a small exhibit here of about eight instruments. Uh, but there's one we're working on in, in Canada and another one, I'd like to do an exhibit at, in our hometown of Toronto. And, uh, you know, and I'm gonna try to get out and do some more book signings and meet you folks, because it's fun, uh, if my hand will put up with it. Um, and after that, I don't really have plans. And, and, you know, obviously, they're making me feel really guilty when I go in my studio and they're all staring at me, these, these fine fellows. Uh, so they're saying... Well, maybe I'll come over and help you stare at them. <laughs> they're making me feel guilty, but... We'll get them in order. I have to say, and, and I'm sure you appreciate this after you know, 42 years together and, and doing all the great things we did together and always knowing that your life is sort of scheduled, I kind of like the scariness of having no schedule. Uh, it's a really, it's a nice thing for my family to have me around, I think. <laughs> uh, um, and it's nice to not know uh, where, what's next for me. I'm really digging that, and I know it invariably I am a musician at heart, and so when I feel that there's something I have to say musically that I'll attempt to say it, and if it's any damn good, then, then other people will hear it. But You got my number. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> anyway, so that's, that's, great. that's what's, great. what's up. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks, me. Lurks. <laughs> Alex Leibson, what a fine Getty interviewer. Lee. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you. We've got some questions now from this audience that they submitted ahead of time, as well as some of the folks out on the stream. But one thing I wanted to ask, probably one of the most important questions we could ask today is, Alex, how did it feel to interview Getty for the first time? It wasn't as scary as I thought it would be. <laughs> I might do it more often. I might go on the road with them again. 
as an interviewer. Hey, relax. Uh, well, you, I like your, your rate that you charge. Your, your rates are reasonable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got this. <laughs> nice. Well, you got to walk away with something. Let's give him some candy and uh, a bottle of wine. He's all right. <laughs> I work cheap. All right, so um, we had a question here from Sarah, who's out there somewhere, who wanted to know, Getty, how does a bass become one of your favorites? If you think of your number one or number two bass, why do you pick an instrument and kind of stick with it? Why does it become a favorite instrument to play? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so because my first bass, which is downstairs, my, my uh, first Rickenbacker, the 73, that got me through all those early tours, um, I'd always dreamed of having a Ricky ever since I heard Chris Squire play. Yeah. Uh, and so when, when we got our first record advance, when we signed our deal, thanks to the good people of Cleveland responding, it's a true story, you guys responded to Working Man on the radio and that led to our first record contract, which led to our first advance. And with that advance, you and I went shopping. And I don't remember you. I don't remember what you bought. Uh, oh, I bought I bought a, a Les Paul. The um, right. A, it was like a deluxe or something with the with the uh, lipstick pickups. Okay. You know the single coils. And, and I bought that Ricky that I dreamed of. And, and so I, I had to make that sound the way I wanted it to sound. Of course, I thought I'd plug it in and I sound just like Chris Square, which <laughs> doesn't work that way. It comes from these things. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, not having Chris Squire's fingers, I worked on uh, my own sound and, and I was talking to Brian Coppola about this and, and I really think it's true. I think you develop your own identity due to a couple of things that have to happen. One of them is failing to sound like your heroes. Uh, that failure of that sends you in a direction when it's combined with your own personality that gives you your sound. So. Uh, so to answer your question more directly, that's how it started for me. And every time I changed to a different bass, it was because I had an idea of a tone that was no longer being satisfied by the bass that was my present number one. And, uh, and that happened so many times in, in my career. And uh, most recently, when I bought my first 1962 jazz bass, the one that I played at the Hall of Fame induction when I played with Yes on that on Roundabout, that is starting to become my current number one because it has a tone that just blows my mind. So, anyway, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Another question along those lines: Dana out here somewhere uh, wants to know uh, what do you look for? What's sort of your holy grail of bass guitar? Or is if there's one that you are waiting to collect? that is not in that collection of basses you have now? Is there something you still want to get? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, collecting is, it doesn't make sense. Uh, it's hard to rationalize. Some people would even go to the extreme of doing a book to rationalize their insanity. <laughs> I have to buy it, it's for the book. <laughs> so yeah, there are a few I haven't been able to found. The search is part of it, you know, sifting through uh, you know, all the contacts I've made through the internet, through, through meeting collectors. I mean, the world of collectors is pretty fun and you learn a lot and then you want to share that. And we have a little group of Toronto nerds, uh, collecting nerds, and we get together and my God, it would bore my wife in about 30 seconds. <laughs> but it's so fun to talk about it. But yeah, there are a few instruments out there that I still have not unearthed and I hope to. Uh, we had a question for you, Alex. Andrew out here wanted to know, would you anytime soon be putting together the Great Gorgeous Guide to Guitar? Is that in your future? I just watched this guy go through this for two years. <laughs> There's no way. <laughs> I can do it for you. <laughs> yeah, okay. Ghostwriter. You know, I... Uh... Most of my guitars are tools, like, you know, Getty had mentioned earlier. I do have some collectible guitars that uh, I have collected over the last several years, but um, there are some really great guitar books uh, out there, like um, Lisa 
Johnson's book is beautiful. Yeah, 100 and, 108 rock star guitars, that's definitely a book to own. Yeah, we're lucky enough to be, to be in that book, and it's, it's really a stunning book. Uh, I don't know, it's a lot of work. I'd rather just play them right. and, uh, and leave it at that. Is there a uh, sort of favorite guitar that you have in your collection that you really enjoy owning? Well, the, the iconic guitar for me is the white 355 that I got in 1976. I mean, that's on so much of our material from when I got it right up until the last album. Uh, I have a 59 uh, reissue Stra uh, Telecaster that I bought in, I think, in 1983. I traded an SG for it. I never really liked the SG. The neck always felt like it was this long <laughs> on it. And so, uh, but that, that Telecaster, I took the finish off the neck, so it's raw wood. And I've probably written 80% of my arrangements on that guitar. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, Getty, someone wanted to know that now that you're an author, Jeff here in the audience asks, would you think of writing anything else? Are you going to become an author? Would you write a history of Rush, an autobiography? Does that interest you at all? Um, it does Baseball interest book, me. right? It, it does interest me, actually. I, I hate to admit. Um, it was a lot of work, but there was something very satisfying about uh, expressing myself in a different way. I mean, I've always used music and my partnership with this cat here uh, to express myself. But when you're uh, hammering out words, you get a different kind of precision out of it. And so, I don't know, uh, I have some ideas and maybe uh, I'll find the time to do that, but I certainly wouldn't jump into a book project right away after this one. <laughs> Give a little space, right? Yeah, a little space. Right. Uh, out there on the stream, we had Rick M. wanted to know, he mentioned that uh, loving you sitting in with Yes getting inducted, where the two of you did the actual induction, which was a great speech. Mm -hmm. And then Getty, you sat in on bass, filling Chris Squire's part there. Yeah. Any interest in playing with those guys again in any capacity? Did you enjoy that night? How, how did that go? Um, I really did love playing that song with them. Uh, it was bittersweet for me because Chris Squire was such a huge hero to me and the fact that he wasn't there was a, a vacuum that no one can fill properly. Uh, and I felt for his, you know, his family, because uh, I know that that's all that was on their mind that day. So I felt a, a real weight to, to pull it off. So I practiced as I usually do, like a, like a crazy person, uh, to make sure I didn't embarrass Chris by my performance. And uh, um, the guys were really sweet to me, the guys in the band, and you know, they've gone through their own travise. There are sort of two versions of Yes, and, and I guess they had a, fall, a schism at some point. So that was the first time they'd been together again as a band in quite a while. And so it was a bit of a little awkward at a few moments, but uh, they all came together and they were very kind and indulged me when I kept wanting to play the song over and over again. <laughs> and there's a lot to play in that song, too. There's the a bass, lot of right? notes per second in that song. Yeah. <laughs> um, another question a few people act had actually asked about, both on the stream and here, was the idea, again, similar to Chris Squire, that you're such an amazing uh, melodic bass player and a singer at the same time. Is that something that you find difficult, or is it now just part of what you do? Uh, it's always difficult, frankly. Uh, you really have to split your, split your ends, as the Trogs used to say. Um, I find that when, uh, when I'm writing a song, I don't pay attention to anything but what bass part suits the song best. And the same thing when I'm, I'm putting the vocals together, I, I do what suits the song best. But when you come to reproduce that live, sometimes it's like, what was I thinking? <laughs> oh my God, how am I going to do this? So. What I do is I woodshed until I can play the bass part pretty much without thinking about it. Yeah. And then I start introducing the vocals. And uh, um, the song, The Anarchist, on our last Clockwork album Angels. Yep. was probably the most difficult bass vocal song I've ever had to play live. I, I realized that after I had written it that the chorus is so diametrically opposed rhythmically to what the vocal is doing that, my God, it was so hard to learn. But anyway, I, I figured it out finally. 
And you guys opened the R40 tour with that, too. I think most of the shows were yeah, that yeah. tune, right? Yeah, it was, uh, Get it out of the way first. Our occasional opener, yeah. <laughs> um, Daniel, here in the audience, said, uh, would either of you ever think about working as producers or doing anything like that with other artists, taking what you've learned over the years and helping them make albums? Well, we have done that. Uh, it's a little different now, I think. Um, the whole industry is quite different. I mean, a lot of artists now do have a whole group of producers right. that, that do all the work for them. Um, I have to say, for me personally, probably not so much so anymore. I did enjoy it when I did it, but uh, currently I like to play more. And You've I've been, been playing, playing on a lot, on a lot I've been of records. I've playing a lot and, and you know, guesting on a lot of different projects. It, and really a wide variety of things. So it keeps this going and it keeps these going and, and that's really what I'm after. Uh, you know, after not, you know, ending our careers as a touring band, there's always the fear of, well, what's next? What am I going to do next? And I think that probably informed the book a lot for you. Yeah, to that make was... something that's still connected to music and yeah. your instrument and all of that. That was and, really therapeutic. And for, for me. me, I started getting offers, you know, a couple years ago to just guest on a few things here and there. And that grew into a, a broader thing, which is really uh, satisfying for me. We were talking last night about you playing with Mayhem right. a little bit, right? Yeah, the same thing is for me. Uh, I, I did some production, some producing uh, um, a number of years ago. And uh, although, although I enjoyed it, it was uh, frustrating to a certain degree because you're sort of in charge of a project, but you're not. It's someone else's project. So uh, it's great to, to tutor young people and to help them achieve what they want to achieve, but it's also a little frustrating because in the end, you can put your heart and soul and spend 24 hours a day in the studio. And it, they can always say, nah, we don't like that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'd rather put that effort into my own stuff, like Alex says. Um, another question that was really common in a lot of people submitting was about the fact that we're here in Cleveland right now. And you mentioned it at the beginning, you know, a town that, you know, helped you guys break uh, into the bigger scene with rock and roll. And, of course, Time Machine recorded here uh, in Cleveland. Does Cleveland still kind of hold a special place in your heart at all that you remember this town and like coming here? Uh, without question. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be sitting here without the good people of Cleveland, as I said earlier. I mean, their response to Working Man changed our lives. Uh, so that, that can never be taken away, and, and that will always be something that bonds us to this, uh, this town. So yeah, thank really, you. One of the first gigs we played in America was here with John. Originally, we played right. with... Uh, John Rutsey, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah the Allen the, Theater. Yeah, opening for oh, was ZZ it the Top. Allen? Is that where it was, Allen right? Theater, yeah. ZZ Top, yeah. What was that, June or something? June of 74? That I don't know. And then we, we were <laughs> with the Agora numerous times, and then all the other gigs that we've done here at Richfield. And Some of you guys at the Agora gigs here? All right, we got one anyway. <laughs> the rest are in retirement homes. <laughs> okay, um, I had one or two others here, and then we'll uh, keep moving because we've got a lot of stuff for you guys to do today. Uh, I think it's pronounced Alini uh, on the stream. Wanted to know if there's any other artists, current music that you really like now. Is there stuff that's grabbing your attention that you're interested in? Um, well, for me, um, I've been diving into the past. I I've decided that there's certain jazz artists that I've never known enough about, and I'm sort of studying some of those players. Uh, uh, Bill Evans, one of them, and of course, he, if you listen to some of the bass playing on those Bill Evans records, my God, they're so good. <laughs> and they're playing these big stand-up mothers. So, uh, so I'm sort of burying myself in the past, and I don't really keep up with too much contemporary stuff. Um, yeah. Applause for the past. Yeah, I, you know what? I've been listening to Greta Van Fleet lately. I, at, at first, I thought, you know, obviously, the influence of Led Zeppelin, but it's, it's a new time for them, you know, so many decades later. 
So they're developing their own audience. But what really struck me about them is their musicianship, their desire to become better players, their arrangements, all of those things as young players. I think they're all in their early 20s. There's a real great future for them as they develop their own style, much like we did. I mean, we were a bar band, really. We had our influences, and certainly Zeppelin was a big influence for us. But once we got out and we got a chance to play and develop our own stuff and start writing our own material, you know, we, it, well, you know, that's history. And I see that with them too. They're young enough that they're, they can carry that banner for a rock band into the future. Yeah, more rock bands, more rock bands. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the last question I'll ask on behalf of the Rock Hall, what did it mean to you guys that night uh, out in LA when you got inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Was that, you know, I know beyond the lighted stage, you know, the fact that you weren't inducted in the Rock Hall was the end of the film. How did it feel to finally be up there and, and uh, get welcomed into the house? Is this like your Barbara Walters moment? Are you trying to make us cry on stage? <laughs> Getty, tell me about your most emotional moment okay. in the induction. Um, well, I think I can speak for you, but you can speak for yourself. Blah, blah, blah. Don't say blah, blah. <laughs> Did, did everyone see that coming? Like, everyone here saw that coming. Um, I think it took us by surprise, and I think it's largely due to you people. Um, we had become sort of, uh, uh, what would you say, indifferent about it because it was a question that was asked for so many years. How do you feel about it? How do you feel about not being in the hall, not being in the hall? So we, we sort of had our tongues firmly in cheek when we arrived that day. Uh, we didn't know what to expect, and we thought, okay, we'll see what happens. And, and when Jan Wenner got up there and just alluded to some band from Canada, and you guys responded the way you did, well, you know, it sort of took our breaths away. Oh, yeah. And we, we couldn't believe how long it was going on. It felt like 20 minutes. It was only a couple <laughs> minutes, but it really... And he, and he was overwhelmed. Uh, and it, it suddenly said to me in that moment that why I'm there and, and what I have to pay heed to and, what I ha and who I have to appreciate for that honor. So uh, it... From that moment on, it became a very, I think, special and more serious moment than we had anticipated. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Well, Getty, the book is amazing. Uh, it really is uh, both a beautiful, beautiful book to look at but the history and the work you put into it and the passion you mentioned earlier, it absolutely comes out. You know, we were joking, you, you couldn't put it down reading yeah. it, right? I mean, it's, it keeps pulling you in about the history of the instruments. I'm so excited that all these folks will be able to uh, get their copy and get it signed uh, today. Yep. So if you folks don't mind, I'm gonna ask everybody to stay right where you are. I've got a few things I wanna review with you about the process, but in the meantime, so we can get him and where he needs to get going, Let's give it up for Alex Lifeson and Getty Lee of Rush. Thank Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys.